something new at the St. Louis Art Museum. We'll have that story next on City Corner. City Corner. Well, there's always something exciting going on at the St. Louis Art Museum, and uh, this year in particular, the new East Building opened not too long ago, and we want to welcome our guest today to talk about that and some other things going on there. Simon Kelly is curator of modern contemporary art. Tricia Paik, did I say that correctly, yes, Tricia? Did. <laughs> I was scared when I started. <laughs> Tricia is the associate curator of modern and contemporary art. We welcome you both uh, to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, the new East Building opened recently, and I was lucky enough a few days before the public opening to go down, and um, uh, Brett Benjamin, the museum director, was kind enough to give me a walking tour through it, and uh, I guess my reaction is, wow, mm -hmm. and a long time coming. What can you tell me about um, how long this has been in the works, well, and, this... and what, it took to, what it took to bring it here? Yeah, I mean, actually, I came to the museum in 2010, and the, you know, the the whole process goes back long before my arrival, I think as far back as 2005, if not earlier. Um, but there was a competition, Chipperfield was chosen. He's, he's an architect who has you know, a really high profile in Europe. He's done major projects in England, in, Sir in Germany. Sir David Chipperfield. Sir David Chipperfield, he's knighted, knighted recently. Uh -huh. um, but really, you know, he's not as well known as he should be in America. Uh, and this is the largest project that he's done to date here. But now um, he'll be much better known, I think. Well, we, the, yeah, yeah, exactly, that's what we hope. And, um, um, and we've all been, you know, thrilled and, and, and you know, extremely excited by what he's managed yeah, to... Yeah, Trish, you say much better known, and that's true. I've, from what I've read, he's, the, your new East Building and his work has gotten a lot of, I want to say, international press. Yeah, we've gotten yeah. amazing responses to the building, and it really comes from the drive of the museum and then of David Chipperfield to design a building that is meant for the art and not architecture first. And we're so proud in what he was able to design for us. We have some exterior shots of the new East Building of the St. Louis Art Museum in Forest Park. Let's take a look at that. And what can you tell me about, uh, I know Mr. Benjamin was telling me about, um, uh, they decide to use concrete, yeah. but they're also using aggregate stone that's natural to this part of the country. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, just to follow up on that last point, it was interesting, you know, for me coming from London, to see, we, we got a great review in the Financial Times you know, last week of, of, of the building. So, you know, it's great to see the international response to what we're doing. Um, but yeah, these are, you know, polished concrete panels. Um, the panels have Missouri um, River Stone in them, which has a touch of red, which integrates really nicely with the, the color of, of, uh, of the Cass Gilbert building. So the two, you know, old and new, really fused together in a very thoughtful way. Yeah, mm -hmm. very successfully. And, and really, also, the call was to create a design that would be um, uh, add a, a respectful addition to the 1904 Cass Gilbert building. The, the, it works so interesting because, of course, you had the classical building from the, the World's Fair and then this new addition. And you wouldn't think they'd match, but somehow they fit together. Yeah, there's a really beautiful fluid transition, not only in the exterior, but also in the interior. There's a really great logic for the collection. I think, too, there's, there's a kind of an underly underlying sense of order to both of the buildings, you know, the classical order of the Cass Gilbert building <coughs> and the more kind of modern minimalist order of, of Chipperfield's building, but the two, they complement each other. Right, so. and a great sense of grandeur, too, in, in the spaces from the exterior as well as when you go inside. What I was struck with on the inside is how, and I don't know if it's because of the dimensions are the same or what, but when I'm walking through the rooms in the New East Building, it feels like I'm in the original building. I don't know, are the rooms the same size or how did they achieve that? Do you know what I'm I saying? Don't, I, don't, I don't think they're the same size, but I mean, they're, they're, there's a similar grandeur in both the, the, the spaces, so maybe that's what you're picking up on. Yeah, yeah. and I think yeah. he and David Shipperfield wanted to make sure that there would be a connection between the two. Um, but some of the, the heights, the, the, the height is definitely taller. We have 16 foot tall ceilings. These the great, galleries. the whole skylight. Yeah, yeah, and then the, the coffered, the concrete coffered ceiling is one of the, the pivotal um, design points of this building that will um, characterize us differently from other museums. 
Tell me who Goldworthy is. Goldsworthy. Goldsworthy. Goldsworthy, excuse yeah. me. And Andy Goldsworthy, he's a British artist, and he's generally categorized as a land artist, you know, an artist who works with nature. Uh, he tends to produce uh, more ephemeral work on the one hand with ice, with rocks, with sticks, you know, work which would disappear with time. But alongside that, he also produces more permanent um, works. And, He's produced one of those for us, for our museum, uh, a permanent installation called Stone Sea. We have some images of that, and I want to explain, there's sort of like a little <coughs> outdoor courtyard between the East Building and the original building, and this is what's in the courtyard. Yeah, it fills it up. It's a very unusual site that was created where, where actually David Chipperfield merged the new building with the old, as Simon was saying, and so it was just this this negative space that was produced. And um, Andy Goldsworthy came to visit us. He actually has a great connection to St. Louis. He first showed here in the mid 80s, again at Laumeier Sculpture Park in the early 90s. And um, he was invited to come to the museum. We've shown a floor plan of this there site. There you go. On the scale. Yeah. yeah, we used a number of uh, scaled models for him to design yeah. the plan of Stone Sea and to create this network of 25 stone arches quarried locally using limestone, which is the bedrock of St. Louis in the Midwest. And there's another view. And it's so interesting because uh, there's a hallway down on the main floor where you can see this through some windows. And then you can see it from a terrace, and you can see it from above. So it's, right. it's interesting the different ways you can view it. He thought, I mean, he thought about that a lot, the different vistas that you can view the piece from. And the, you know, the, the image that you're seeing on the screen now, that, that's, that's a good one because you know, the piece is about, is about the history of, of this area, you know, when we once were an ancient sea, and he's tried to you know, tap into that history. So particularly when you see the piece from above, you get this wonderful sense of flowing water of, one, of the sea. So. Can I make one point that I think is really exciting about the project is that um, it's a very unusual outdoor sculpture project and that usually an artist uses the open vista, but here he's actually chosen to see, to use a site that is always yeah. hidden from the public yeah. and you have to experience it as you walk around our expanded campus. And that's what is so, such a strong, rigorous uh, pro, uh, conceit of this work. Mm -hmm. I, it, was, it was beautiful, yeah. I thought, really great that's, experience. That's good, I'm glad you felt that. <laughs> that's what we want everyone to say, so. Let, let's make one point before we go on, and we want to look at some, uh, some of the work you, you both have curated. <coughs> uh, you both have curated there. The reason for the new building was that there are a lot of museum pieces, I guess they just didn't have the room to show. Yeah, that's, right. that's true. I mean, we have a you know, very strong contemporary collection. We define our contemporary collection as post-World War II, um, and this building gives us the opportunity to show more of that. So in, in the permanent collection uh, spaces, which are focusing on post-war American art, we have about 90 pieces on view, and about 30% of those have not been shown for a decade or more. And then in the special exhibition space, we have post-war German art, which Trisha will speak about. Um, and there we have about 60 works on view. As I'm trying to remember what Mr. Benjamin told me, did it increase your museum space by 20% or more than that? I think about 30%. About 30%. 30%. 30%. 30%. Yeah. And it also includes a, a great garage, yeah. which doesn't sound glamorous, but it's a wonderful thing right, to have. Right, right. Public amenities was really important in the expansion as well. More parking spaces, yeah. uh, a nicer coat check, yeah. more bathrooms, and of course our new restaurant panorama, which everyone should come yeah, Right, which great. overlooks Art Hill, great. does it not? Overlooks Actually, Art and, Hill. and the cafe. We have a nice cafe, too. And the cafe, cafe underground, so, yeah. yeah. So. How's the food, by the way? Pretty good. Everything is very good, <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Tricia, you, uh, you curated post-war German exhibition. Yes. Um, and so, the, the museum is very well known for its German work. Yeah, we're really we're no, we're known internationally for our, our strengths in post-war German art. And um, just to clarify, the galleries that now house this post-war German installation are actually going to become our our regular loan exhibition galleries. And Simon is curating our first loan show that will appear in Feb March. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but because because of the reason for expanding, Brent Benjamin wanted to make sure that we would showcase our great strengths, which is post-war German artists, Simon said, and, and American. Let's take a look at some of sure. this uh, German work. And is it Richter? Yeah, Gerhard Richter. And there is our well-known and beloved um, Betty. Uh, it is what we consider our Mona Lisa, um, an extraordinary work by Gerhard Richter, um, painted after a photograph that the artist took of his daughter uh, when she was a young girl. And um, the, the use of the brush stroke to kind of create this photographic look is something that's 
uh, that provides a kind of mystery to the work and just the fact that she's looking away. Right. There's a bit of amb ambiguity. What is she looking I at? I keep looking to try to see what she's looking at. Yeah, I mean, she could, she, actually, the, there's thought that she's looking at a, another painting by her father, a grayscale painting. We have another Richter piece, January. Actually, just to chime in on that one, that um, we lent that painting recently to a large Richter retrospective in Paris, and they use that as their key marketing image. So right. that, that painting was blown up on the side of the Pompidou in Paris. Yeah, that was it, was, it was great, great to see. Yeah. Wow. So. so this is January? Uh, this is from a, an important series of paintings from 1989 uh, using uh, Gerhard Richter's iconic approach of, of using large-scale plastic squeegees to kind of drag and pull paint across, painted in many, many layers. Uh, and this was painted during the time after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And so there's definitely a kind of uh, response to <clears throat> this very historic moment time. What moment. kind of scale are these? Oh, um, <clears throat> these are about, oh, I'm bad with, it was, let's see, probably about 10, 10 feet high? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say they're large. Yeah. yeah, they're quite, they're yeah. quite large. Uh, we have three of them, um, two, three, two diptychs, and they're, they make an extraordinary impact in the insulation. The next German work we have is by an artist named Boyce. Joseph Boyce um, was an iconic uh, influential figure in the post-war German era. He was also a great professor at the uh, Arts Academy in Dusseldorf and taught a whole slew of young artists. And during this time after World War II and, um, and their role in the Holocaust, there, there was a, a pull and a, and a push for artists to address this tragic and traumatic history. Uh, and there's a bit of a pullback too. So here he's actually using a, a Blackboard to teach a, a lecture, to use at a lecture in Rome in 1972. And the next German artist we're going to take a look at is Struth or Struth? Yeah, Thomas Struth. Struth. Uh, this is an image taken in the Pantheon in Rome, and this is an example of uh, a very significant group of uh, contemporary German artists who are transforming uh, photography into the scale of painting. And this is actually a very large scale photograph um, where he's examining people in public spaces and aspects of looking in, in such sites as this grand space of uh, Pantheon. So this from the post-war, German post-war uh, collection yes. that you have. That's, and this is in the New East Building, is this it This is not? in the New East Building and the special exhibition galleries spanning from the 1960s to the contemporary day. Well, I know you both were, have worked very hard on the, uh, some of the permanent collection. We come back from the mm -hmm. break, we're going to uh, sample some of that. So we're talking about what's going on at the St. Louis Art Museum, and we'll continue right after this. Throw away money on wasted electricity. You're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. G morning sunshine. Wakey wakey. Text me. Are your parents home later? We can hang. L U V love you. J K. Holla back, holla back, holla back. <laughs> Are you with your friends? That's lame. We're in a huge fight right now. XO. What'd you dream about? Something I did. Are you on your way to the mall? I'm lonely. Nude pics. Send me some. Text me. is being accused of committing one of the largest investment frauds in the history of the United States. I guess we're not going to Aspen. That's fine. 
You see, I like tennis balls. He likes insider trading. So he's going to jail, and I'm going to a shelter. And no, they're not the same thing. Shelters are for good pets that want to be adopted. Jails are for criminals. I've done nothing. Uh-oh. Okay, I stole a cheeseburger once on my dog. I'm Steve Potter and welcome back to City Corner. We're talking with curators Simon Kelly and Tricia Paik from the St. Louis Art Museum about a lot of things. Um, one, the recent uh, grand opening of the new East Building, which expands the space by something like 30% at the St. Louis Art Museum. And just briefly on that, what do you both think? Does this, how significant is this new building, not just for the art in St. Louis, but as far as bringing notoriety to the St. Louis Art Museum and the art community and around the globe, which already has a lot of. I mean, I, th I, I think it's great. It's, I mean, it's interesting in a way. You know, I come from, um, from London, so I'm kind of an outsider. Tricia, you're from? Oh, well, originally California, but came from New York. Right. So, so we're both, you know, <laughs> we're not native St. Louisans, and so we both in, in some ways see, you know, things from a little, little bit from outside. And, from my point of view, I think it's really going to raise the national, the international profile of, of, of the city, and we have a great collection here, and this really allows us to, to foreground it. Yeah. I, might, I might say <laughs> I did uh, on my program on St. Louis Public Radio, Cityscape. <coughs> we did a, a virtual audio tour with uh, the museum director Brent Benjamin. So if you want to go to stlpublicradio.org, the Cityscape page, uh, you can listen to that, and it's really interesting. It's about 20 minutes where we walk through and kind of paint an audio image of what we're seeing. Well, you both have worked on uh, the permanent collection at the St. Louis Art Museum. We want to take a look at some of that now. Great. Uh, the first is by an artist named Judd, and this is untitled. So this is a, um, a sculpture by the minimalist uh, artist Donald Judd. It has a key place in our installation. It's a very large piece. A um, couple of things to say about that. One is that he's really kind of questioning traditions of sculpture by removing any kind of platform or plinth and actually placing the sculpture on the ground. And then um, I think he's really experimented with color um, and, and plexiglass, you know, a, a newly in invented kind of medium and, and exploring with that as a, as a medium for art. Mm -hmm. So you get this wonderfully kind of luminous color uh, when you look through the piece. Uh -huh. Let's go to Andy Warhol. This is Most Wanted Men, number 12, Frank B. Yeah, of course, Andy Warhol is a well-known household name. Um, but here in this painting, he's taken an image of the most wanted man at that, one of the, one of the most wanted men that time in New York City in the early 1960s, and um, is actually uh, based on a work he made for the World's Fair in 1964 for a pavilion designed by the architect Philip Johnson. When uh, I think of Andy Warhol, that's... I, I wouldn't have guessed that was his work. Yeah, well, his yeah. use of the mugshot and, and photographic imagery is, is definitely something that, that an iconic form that, that Andy would manipulate with. The next artist is Maratu. Julie Maratu. Julie Maratu. Julie Maratu. Trisha, Julie why don't you Maratu. Say yeah, about this, this. Yeah. we're really proud of, proud of this work. It's a recent acquisition uh, from 2009. Uh, Julie Maratu is uh, one of the most significant um, abstract artists working. Uh, uh, of this time, and here she's creating this extraordinary um, merging of space, of energy, um, of color, drawing from architectural plans, um, graphic uh, corporate logos, and really um, developing a new form of, abstra of abstraction um, in the 21st century. Yeah, we were talking about scale before. It'd be true in the permanent collection. Most of these things are quite large also, aren't they? Yeah, this one actually is more domestic scale, but what we really found in the David Chipperfield building is um, spaces that really work fluidly for both large-scale works like our Gerhard Richter, but also smaller, smaller scale paintings like, like this Moret too. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a lot more than uh, a gallery than the novice might think, right? As far as putting a work on a wall, it's a little more than that. No, yeah, yeah, there are many decisions that <laughs> are a lot of thought. Lot of thought. Yeah. We use yeah. a scaled model. We come up with checklists. We yeah. have conversations with really? each other, conversations with a map maker, conservator, designer. Um, a lot of thought does does take ha does happen. It does, and one of the things that you you know this this building really allows for are great sight lines. So you'll see that as you walk through the building, and we, we thought a lot about that. You know, you have these vistas through space, and hopefully, we hope you know great juxtapositions between objects. The next artist from the permit collection we want to look at is Pollock. 
And this is number three. Number three, 1950. Yeah, this is a, um, actually a recent gift, and it's, um, it's a great example of, of, of Jackson Pollock's drip painting. You know, he, he developed that technique, I think, around 1947. This is from 1950, but really kind of shook up the established traditions of, of Western painting by, by placing his canvas on the floor um, and really performing inside of it. Um, so he's, you know, splattered and drip paint across the canvas here with a range of, of color and industrial paint too. You can see the aluminum paint, uh, mm -hmm. it was a silver paint there. Creates a sense of sort of motion, I guess. That's what he wanted, yeah. 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 Next piece, uh, Nevelson, and this is New Continent. Um, this one, uh, yes, by Louise Nevelson, who um, was a very significant sculptor who used the form of assemblage, um, which is a form of joining and, and merging uh, non-art items. And so here she kind of scavenged um, buildings about to be torn down, houses, and she's using balusters, um, chair legs, uh, using this grid form. And um, this is now installed in one of our large galleries and has made a great impact. Do you have any advice for the, maybe the novice? The, you know, some people maybe not don't get uh, contemporary art because it's not a bowl with fruit in it. Right. What, what do you tell people about how to appreciate that? Well, I always yeah. tell people that um, it's okay if you don't understand it right away. <laughs> and what these artists started to do in the beginning of the 20th century was move away from representing the real world as we know it and as we see, see it. And questioning how we look at the world. And so I always tell people it's okay if you don't understand because mm -hmm. that's what these artists are trying to do, question how you exist in the world. And so abstraction was a way to separate from those kind of depictions. And, and abstraction makes, <coughs> creates emotion, right? Emotion. It makes you feel a certain way. Yeah. I agree with that. I mean, I, I would just, you know, just ask people to be open-minded. I mean, for example, we have a great um, piece which we acquired recently by the St. Louis artist Tom Friedman, which is a beautiful piece. It's called Untitled Seascape. It's a, it's a single piece of archival rag paper which has been creased at its midpoint and then wrinkled in, in the bottom half and it represents a sea. And to some people that's going to be a, quite a difficult work, I think, to understand, but it's a very sensitive, very thoughtful work. Well, let's look at some more. Uh, tell me about this artist, Drew, and this is untitled. Um, this is, do you want to say something? About sure. Um, yeah. Leonardo Drew, um, we acquired this in the late 1990s and this is a work that is installed like a mural uh, across the gallery walls and um, is beautifully cited right now in our new gallery, so I invite everyone to come and see it. Uh, here he made it in separate panels. Um, we were counting maybe about 300 yeah. or so panels, um, each about this wide and, and this tall. And he's also, just like Louise Nevelson um, before, before him, uh, using assemblage and taking uh, found materials and, um, you know, like feathers and ropes and right. books and then resting it and creating this monumental uh, mural-like form that has a lot of power when you right. come in to the gallery. So this actually, when you come into the gallery, it's, <laughs> you know, we thought about the installation and, and the Drew and the Nevelson kind of bookend the gallery. So they make a, you know, great, a great space as a whole. Next is Spectrum 2 by Ellsworth Kelly. Yes, Ellsworth Kelly. Um, it, this is a classic work by uh, the great modernist abstract master Ellsworth Kelly, uh, where he's taken 13 separate panels to create the spectrum form across from yellow to yellow. And he was an artist, he's an artist to uh, really reinvestigate painting in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and uh, investigating how we perceive the world and how, how we look at shape and color. And this is one of our popular works here at the St. Louis Art Museum. Now that's huge, isn't it? It's quite large okay. too, and it's installed adjacent to the Donald Judd that we just talked about a few minutes ago. Next we have an artist by the name of Close, and this is a piece entitled Keith. So th this, is, um, this is a pretty iconic work for the, for the museum. It's, it's a well-known piece. It, as you say, it's Keith. It shows a, a sculptor friend of Chuck Close called Keith Hollingworth, and it's, it's one of a series of portraits that, that Close did around this time. He also um, painted Richard Serra, um, Philip Glass, the composer, um, and it's, you know, it's a photorealist piece. He painted, with, with, painted it with an airbrush, um, so he plays, and based on a photograph, so he plays with focus, and you know, his, his sitter, Keith, actually had facial paralysis, and you can see that in the way that he's you know, represented the, uh, the sitter. And finally, an artist that uh, I've heard a lot about, I guess just the last couple of years, I don't know why, 
Rothko, is, it's Mark Rothko, isn't it? Mark Rothko, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Mark Rothko is installed uh, with our beautiful and stunning uh, Jackson Pollock in one of the first galleries uh, in the new building. And Mark Rothko was also such a leading abstract expressionist along with Jackson Pollock who used abstraction to get to the basic core of humanity. And these are artists in the 1950s responding to the devastation of World War II, the way the German artists are well, as well. And so he is trying to embrace just the there's the core values of what it means to be a human being in this era and uh, access ac issues of tragedy and humanity. And so he's using these forms to, as you said earlier, to kind of draw expression and emotion. Isn't there the a quote, visitor. there's a quote by him that where he talks about art, he wants it to be tragic and timeless. Yes. Like early quotes. I think so, that yeah. was quote in the New York yeah. Times. Yeah. Yeah. And so this, when you go, when you, fa when you face it, you really are drawn into the painting. Uh, a lot of these artists, a lot of our viewers may not be familiar with. How well known does an artist have to be to make it into the collection of the St. Louis Art Museum? Do you yeah. have to be a big, big name? You don't have to be a big name, no. We try to be open-minded and, and, and open to, you know, to up-and-coming artists. But you have to have exhibited ability to create work of art that we believe, that we hope will last mm -hmm. the test of time. True. And that's always yeah. a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> we've sampled a lot of the permit collection. We looked at some of the German collection. There are a lot of other things at the St. Louis Art Museum, not just mm -hmm. uh, paintings on the walls. What are some of your favorites, just real briefly? Yeah, I just wanted to make that yeah. point, actually, that even though there's a lot of attention on the East Building, all the other curators at the St. Louis Art Museum have reimagined their own collections in the main building, Cass Gilbert. So it's really uh, an unveiling of a new entire museum and not just the East Building. But if you like uh, period furniture or Egyptology, I yeah. mean, there's something for everybody. That's, that's actually very important. And, and, you know, the East Building is part of a, it's part of a larger whole, actually, but, you know, the main building, as Tricia says, it's been extensively, extensively reinstalled, and some, you know, some great uh, reinstallations there. So we, you know, what what we've done in the in the East Building is part of a, a bigger project. So and Simon, you have something coming up next year, I think, is impressionism. Um, I yes, I I do. I have a um, show an impressionist landscape painting and photography, uh, and that opens in in March of of next year uh, at the museum, and it should be a great show. It's around the idea of nation and the way in which. You know, landscape paintings and photographers traveled around France and you know, to the sort of distant, distant fringes of the country and, and in, in sort of exploring the country really constructed a new idea of what France meant. Well, Simon Kelly, we want to thank you and Tricia Paik for being here. The St. Louis Art Museum is a great place. It's one of those places where if you haven't been in a while, you need to go. Indeed. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Sue. Must yeah. be a thank beautiful you. place to work. No, yeah. lovely place to work. Thanks yeah. so much for sharing with us today and I hope people go nuts only see the permanent connection, but check out the East Building. Yeah. It's certainly worth it. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Steve Potter, and thanks for your attention today. We'll see you next time on City Corner.